Like a backstage pass to the world of fly fishing travel, this is Waypoints, the podcast of destination angling. News and events, helpful travel tips, destination profiles, great stories, and expert advice from some of the most seasoned and experienced names in fishing travel. Waypoints is brought to you by Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures, the industry's number one specialty travel company for the very best insider knowledge, logistical support, and trip preparation. Freshwater or saltwater, international or domestic, Yellow Dog has you covered for your next fishing adventure. And now, your Waypoints host, Yellow Dog founder and director, Jim Klug. Today's episode is being recorded on location at Scorpion Atoll, 70 miles north of the Mexican port town of Progreso, off the northern coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Scorpion is a desolate outcropping of flats and tiny islands surrounded by a notoriously treacherous reef, a reef that, over the years, has claimed more than its fair share of both lives and vessels. Also known as Arecife Alacranes, legend has it that Scorpion Atoll received its ominous name from a group of 16th century Spanish shipwreck survivors. Those that survived an initial shipwreck to make it to the tiny and inhospitable islands of the atoll found that the bleak environment then killed their comrades slowly and painfully, much like a scorpion sting. I am joined today by Raul Castaneda, the owner of Tarpentown Campeche and Scorpion Atoll Fly Fishing Expeditions, the only commercial outfitter that offers trips to the scorpion fishery. Raul began fishing scorpion in the early 2000s, and since that time, he's developed an incredibly unique liveaboard operation that allows a very small number of anglers to access and fish some of the most remote and unvisited flats found anywhere in the Caribbean. Raul, myself, and our group are just finishing a five-day trip on Scorpion, recording this episode aboard the mothership after several great days of both polling and waiting the flats for permit and bonefish. Raul, welcome to Waypoints, and thanks for sitting down to talk with us about this amazing location. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Glad to be here with you and the and your gang. Very nice setup, guys, and uh, we're having fun. We're having fun, definitely. Well, I got to tell you, there are some damn big fish out here. <laughs> It, uh, it is an incredible destination. It's unlike any other in the Caribbean with characteristics that honestly, you know, you don't feel like you're fishing in the Yucatan. I feel when I come out here that I'm more, it's more like I'm in the Indian Ocean or someplace that's half a planet away. That's what it is. It's, uh, you know, uh, when we started the program, um, we realized that the, the, this, the average fish was way above the average in the Caribbean side of Mexico. Um, even in Belize, I think the, the, the size goes a little smaller. Um, this, this fishery has its features because it's very, very close to the deep water drop. So that's, uh, there's an interaction every day when the big fish comes to feed on the flats, and then they go back for shelter. There's big sharks around. You saw the sharks way, way, you know, a little bit uh, above the average size of sharks that we get, even, even a, a little longer than the skiffs, right? So... So that's also a threat for the fish. So uh, they feel comfortable feeding sometime in the day and they go back, but that's the big fish that lives in the deep water of the atoll. Well, I want to find out a little bit more about your story, Raul. How did you first find your way to these waters? Tell us how you first heard about Scorpion Atoll and when it was that you first visited. Thank you. Uh, back in the 90s, late 90s, I got I got married and... Uh, 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 a relative, my wife's relative, they had a nice boat and uh, they invited us to come here. I, I wasn't doing or pretending any fly fishing or any light, any light, light uh, uh, tackle or anything. We just came because I didn't know where we were. We just, they told us we were going to drive for three, four hours, ride, ride for three, four hours, and, and we're going to get to a nice place. We're going to troll for big kudas. We're going to spend the night in a nice beach and we're going to go back to Progreso. So, uh, we know, we, we got in that adventure and, uh, you know, I saw a uh, uh, something that I wasn't prepared for that. As soon as we started to get to the lighthouse uh, island, the color of the of the water just got us charmed uh, the very first time. So anyway, I wasn't the patron on that boat, right? So I had to head back over. Uh, back uh, Later in the years, I started the program in Campeche, and we started fly fishing, and we started guiding people. So one day, a friend of mine told me that... Uh, we should go see those islands. And I said, yeah, that's what I might be wanting to do. So we've got some sponsorship, you know, because it's quite a, quite a while, quite a, a, a way to get here, fuel, you know, sufficient, efficiency, sufficiency, everything has to get together. So we, we embarked on this uh, 
uh, first ride, unfortunately, I had to quit at the very first, at the very last minute because uh, my, my dad had a problem. Had a, he, he, he got to, to the hospital. So um, I sent my crew with my friends, and the first thing they said after three days they were here, when they, come back, when they came back, they showed me pictures of incredible bone fishing. They were so amazed. So it took me maybe two weeks to get another trip together and, you know, come by myself after everything was set up. And, um, yeah, what I discovered was some, actually some big and dumb fish. They were eating. They can eat anything. I have a picture that you may have seen it there. Uh, uh, they ate a needlefish fly. We were casting to Akuda, and the bonefish came and took it. Maybe it was an eight-pound bonefish, you know. So uh, we started to prepare trips. We started to plan trips. And it's been a whole adventure to get to the point where we are. And I'm glad that you're here just checking it out. Well, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, my first trip out here was about four or five years ago. Um, we had a chance to come back this week. Uh, it is a special place. There is no doubt about it. Um, talk to us a little bit about how a Scorpion Atoll trip works. Where does it all begin and kind of how do you access the atoll? What does a, a trip look like for an angler that wants to come down and visit these waters? Okay, great. Um, the first thing that everyone needs to know is that it's just a, a couple of hours flight from a, most of the uh, uh, U.S. Air airport gateways, right? So everything lands in Merida. We have connections through Miami or through Houston, even through Mexico City. You can fly into Merida Airport. That's where you fly in. That's the main city. And uh, depending on the timing, depending on the weather conditions, you may start spending the first night in Merida and head over to the to Progreso, where the harbor is. It's about an, about an hour ride to, to, to the harbor. We... Uh, we, we have, you know, the boat loaded there. So as soon as you get to the dock, we're heading out to the atoll. And it takes us, depending on the weather again, from, uh, could be from four to six hours, even seven hours cruise. We try to go, you know, on a tr kind of a trolling, troller speed, uh, 10 to 12 knots, not that, you know, fast. And as soon as we get here, we check with the marine uh, uh, point that they have here. We just show them our papers. Everything is, you know, set up previous. They have a dispatch, a marine dispatch, so everyone has his fishing license, everyone his park management waistbands because we have to wear a waistband or at least have them on board and paid fees to the national parks. This is a national park. And um, once we have that check-in process done, we're getting off and fishing right away on the first island. Well, it, it's, uh, it's a journey to get out here, but... You know, as you were saying, Merida is super easy to access. There are direct flights from the U.S., Houston, Dallas, Miami, Atlanta, and it's a really neat city. It's not uh, as touristy or as visited as, you know, Cancun further to the south and some of the other big beach resorts. There's a ton of history in Merida. Um, I think it's a super interesting exp uh, city to visit and explore, and I always like overnighting on the front end. It also gives you a little bit of a buffer if there's weather delays, that, you know, things like that, because the, the conditions do have to be good for the crossing. Um, and then, as you said, the morning uh, you depart from Merida, you head to Progresso, hop on the boat, and you know, four to seven hours later, you're out here. So not a bad journey from the States. Um, describe a, a typical fishing day out here on Scorpion. How does the, the daily fishing program work? Okay. The, uh, what, uh, what, well, first of all, uh, you need to know that uh, we're trying to maximize anglers' time fishing, right? Um, Obviously, uh, bone fishing, you need a little bit of light uh, to start going for it. But what we try is to, you know, get up with the first sunlight, uh, have some coffee, breakfast, muffins, eggs, bacon, regular American, uh, Mexican fusion uh, breakfast. And we're getting off the boat uh, around 8 in the morning. And the thing is that we're not on a rush. We're, we're, we're mostly fishing all day long. We just make break up for lunch, uh, come back to the boat for lunch, and then go back again to the beach for uh, either uh, beach fishing, I mean wading, or in the boat. We have a panga that we pull over the area that we know there's permit and more stuff. So uh, basically we're fishing from 8 till maybe 7 at night. With long a break. days. Long days, definitely. Swollen feet. Got to tell you that. <laughs> You, you, you have to have the, you know, the right and most comfortable wading boots there. Yeah, I, we've been here for five days. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, it's long days in the water, and I think that's one of the draws out here at Scorpion. Um, the guides clearly love working in this environment. And the fact that everybody's on the same mothership 
they're not rushing home at you know three or four o'clock at the end of the day. They're out here you know with you the whole time. And uh, so there's never a rush to get back to the boat in the evening. It's pretty nice. You know, we've had a lot of great evening sessions on this trip. And, and as we said, long days out there on the flats. The only time they rush to the boat is when the client asks for a beer. They have to go get a cold beer, right? We need It's pretty, pretty too much sunlight exposure here. That's right. Well, uh, in 1994, I think that's the correct year, the, this atoll was protected and titled as a marine park by right. the, the Mexican Environmental Authority. Uh, really kind of giving it the benefit of having a core zone where most commercial fishing is forbidden. Uh, and, and the result is it's created an abundance of marine life all throughout these waters. And you see it. I mean, the, the ecosystem is so healthy. Huge sea turtles everywhere on the flats. There's lots of rays. The sharks are plentiful, as you mentioned. And in fact, I've never seen a fishery down in this part of the Caribbean that has so many big bull sharks. It's yeah. amazing and, and really a sign of a healthy fishery. You, you want to see that when you when you go to a place. Correct. Um, the sea turtles are, are everywhere. The turtle nests on these beaches um, that we, we walk around wading the flats are everywhere. They, they sometimes seem to really kind of cover the islands. And, and the seabirds themselves. Right now, the turns are so thick around the boat and over the island where we're moored that it looks like there's a cloud covering the main island. Uh, it's, it's an unbelievable ecosystem, yeah, no doubt the, about it. Uh, definitely, there was a the really right move to protect it. Um, I think it's one of the last paradises of Mexico. There's a couple other uh, in the Caribbean that are protected too, but this one, the importance of this one is the only one in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, there's a small one in front of Campeche, but that's been taken over by the oils company, you know, so um, there's not much to protect there anyway, so, in commercial fishing, but this one was protected, and uh, the only uh, fishery that it's allowed and in a certain season is the lobster fishery, because uh, when they tile it, the only community of fishermen that was here, I mean, they don't live here, but they come and, you know, they have seasonally. their fleet seasonally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, by the Constitution, the first place, first and right, so they, they had the right to keep doing the lobster fishing. No no, no liners, no netting, no nothing. So that's what keeps it pretty healthy. I mean, and what you've seen on the islands, the uh, the birds, the, 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 the turtles, this is a time when the turtles are mating. Um, that sharks by itself and the, the you know all the marine life that you can see here is a sanctuary so uh, one one reason of that we do a little just a few trips in the year is first of all to keep it you know low pressure second of all well it's too hard, kind of hard to access here and and the third thing that we are a sustainable to try to be a sustainable fisher what we do we don't leave obviously any trash behind we we ask the people you know, to follow the regulations at the atoll we, we, we should not go across the islands because it's, an, it's a nesting area. And uh, if we can collect any trash that we see, it's, you know, it's welcome on board because we need to cl keep this place clean. We have to, we're proud of, we're proud of ha having this, you know, still pristine and we have to keep it that way. I can tell you really love it out here. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, can anyone fish out at Scorpion, or do you have to have specific permits or paperwork or licenses to come out here and fly fish? Well, you need, uh, definitely you need a dispatch, a marine dispatch. You need fishing license for everyone. You, we, need to, we need to have the uh, operator agreement with the national park. Uh, yeah, there's some paperwork, a little bit of bureaucracy behind it, but, you know, we, we, we've learned it with the past of time. You know, we can do it. Because it's the same thing we do in Campeche. We have to be legally, uh, you know, visiting the areas. Otherwise, we, we, we would put, you know, clients in trouble. We, we don't want that. Well, let's talk about the size of the atoll itself and the fishing areas. It's, it's the largest reef in the southern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the atoll, it's shaped by a system of basically five islands. It's got a number of shallow sandbars. There's lots of coral heads. Um, it's an area, the atoll itself is about six miles wide by 17 miles long. About so, yeah. Okay. And most of the, the islands that you visit of those big five, they're these huge kind of sandbar islands, and they, they all have a skirt of flats mm -hmm. that go around them. Um, and the flats average anywhere from, you know, one to maybe five feet deep, kind of depends. But uh, others, you literally walk to the edge of the flat, and it drops off to, you know, 100 feet mm -hmm. straight. Yeah, right. Actually... This is a living atoll. I mean, you, you come two weeks later, and the, the shape of the, the islands had changed. Uh, occasionally, you can see that there's some keys information. Other, ones, other areas, other, you know, are uh, erosion. 
uh, what it was sandbars uh, last week. Now they're you know they're covered by, by water. So uh, it's it's in constant change. But yeah, definitely there's there's flats and skirts all over where you can wade, and the and, and that's where the fishing the fish comes in to feed from the morals from from the seagrass limb and you know the the sediments. Well, it's uh, it's an interesting place, but it it's not necessarily fishable year round. And let's talk about the seasons or the season for fishing the atoll. The best weather is typically when out here. Well, uh, we live uh, this area is geographically located in the subtropics, and uh, in the subtropics we have just two seasons: summer and winter. Which you know, consider uh, comparing to the ones in North America. Uh, they're a little bit more s stable in terms of temperature, but not in terms of wind. So the um, the 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 fall season, which is uh, September through November regularly, could be you know our summer-like uh, conditions. I know it's hurricane season, but uh, well, there's always something. If it's not a hurricane season, you have the cold front season. There's always something on the tropic in the subtropics. So uh, I would say the least winds from September to November, even late, even in December, if you if you get the right window, could be you know the the best time, the best temperature, more consistent fishing, and the challenging season would be uh, late April through early June because you that's the transition to the summer, the real summer in, in Mexico, and uh, you can have sudden storms in formation, so you don't know when they're going to happen. We actually we had one warning when we were coming in. Uh, anyway, so uh, conditions can be. The weather might be the factor that changes the way you see the best time to come here, right? So, uh, in terms of fishing, I think it's pretty stable. You know, the fishing is the fish is here; uh, they have their cycle. We just come up to chase them any time we can. Yeah, big part is being able to access the atoll right. with weather. So you've got an April, May, June window mm -hmm. in which you guys operate, and then September, October, November. Yes, uh, two choices. Yeah, and. You run maybe four or five anglers a week, yeah, and maybe eight trips a year. The, at most, yeah, at that's, the most. That's what we try. You know, we try to keep it. I mean, we've had we have one year that a ninth group was shaped, so we brought them in. Um, they really were flexible in dates. You know, these trips most people has to you know program in advance. They have to schedule in advance, and uh, a trip like this is very difficult to have it like last minute. You know stuff because it's, it's difficult period but uh, if that happens we can take them out but that's that's normally what we do eight trips a year but that's an incredibly low amount of pressure for this fishery i mean you've got a handful of trips a year you might run let's say 30 anglers a year out mm -hmm. here that's that's not a lot of anglers visiting these flats right that's <laughs> correct and and with the past of time i don't think we have put more than 60 70 fishermen here total total yeah that's that's incredible. Not yeah. a lot of places in the Caribbean, no. you can say that about. No, no, no. Now you guys all um, you kind of skip the the summer months of July and August. Mm -hmm. um, one, it gets hot, uh, but you also get a number of people that come out and just kind of pleasure boats, and they like to come out and anchor on the islands. So that's a little bit more of the the party yacht season, yes, right? And a good time to not be here, right? We don't we don't want to be here when there's uh, you know music and. You know, on each boat and they're partying. The the National Park Office is trying to limit that. They're trying to cut that down because uh, obviously even the noise it's it's a pollution factor for the for the for the island. And um, they're limiting the access now in the summertime for I think a hundred people at most per day. So if you put it at in you know in each jet maybe ten people that includes crew. So you know it could be ten people per boat. That's not much. That's ten boats per, yeah. per day. So uh, th that's the way they're trying to you know set the pressure down on the uh, basically on the islands, on the nesting and the birds and the turtles and stuff. But uh, not fishing. There's not fishing at all here. There, yeah, those boats aren't coming out here to fish. They're no. just coming out here to anchor up, enjoy the beautiful water. Occasionally and party. they go out to some you know rocks and bottoms, or they just find some something to eat they catch it you know amberjacks or groupers or but they're not fly fishing no they're, no, no they're no, not no, wading no, the flats no, no, <laughs> fly fishing is not popular in this area yeah i would say that way well we uh when you come during your two seasons oftentimes you are the only boat on the atoll and there's nobody else out. 90 percent of the time we're the only boat at the atoll yeah well you know the conditions out here whether it's the spring season or the fall season you're you're so far out we're 70 miles 
off the coast out here. Um, it can be windy, no doubt about it, pretty constant. And you, you kind of want that. You know, it helps keep the waters cool and moving. Um, but anglers definitely need to prepare for the wind because the atoll is pretty exposed. There's not a lot of places to hide out here, and it's usually a factor. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, let's talk a little bit about the species out here. And, and the majority of your focus is on the permit and the bonefish that are found on the flats out here. What is it about this place that, that makes these fish so large? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier you've got that immediate access off the flats to deep water. They come on, they can easily feed, and they can bolt off in a nanosecond and be right back in the deep. But there's not a lot of fisheries anywhere in the Caribbean where you consistently find bonefish and permit that are as large as what you see here. I'm going to tell you why, and I think uh, that comes from a question that I had, or a conversation I had with uh, a local fisherman down in Campeche, by the way, uh, I don't know, many, maybe 20, 20 years ago. Uh, I, I was talking to him about the, the sports fishing and the species, and he said, when I talked about the, the, the bonefish, in Campeche we call it macabi, and uh, or, or raton, the mouse. Pez raton. Pez raton. So he said right away, oh, my God, we used to catch them by the ton in deep water because it was bait for shark fishing. So he told me the story about how many they caught, how much fish they caught out on the deep water, and that matches up, you know, with the uh, with this situation here, with these conditions at the atoll. They were catching fish. They were catching bonefish netting years ago, um, maybe uh, to uh, 60 to 80 feet deep with some kind of netting, chinchorros or whatever they use. And that was a big, you know, uh, production of bonefish for shark bait. So... Uh, well, that, that fishery is over. I mean, there's, there, there's no more shark fishing like that. And when I started to, you know, match up all the knowledge and all the conditions that I learned in the atoll, well, definitely that's with this, around the island, around the atoll, that's about 80 to 100 feet deep. That's where they're living. And they come up just to feed on the, on the easy feeding on the, on the grasslands because the sharks can't get into the flats. So they're comfortably eating. They're cruising. the. You can see them pushing water, cruising the the flats and that's i think that's the reason the the, the small bonefish stays down in the on, the on the on the bottom you know they're 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 at home and the big ones come to feed you know on the on the grass flats well you see i mean legitimate 20 pound plus permit on a super regular basis out here and the bonefish seem to be far larger than kind of the typical bones that you might find say in ascension bay or the ishkalak area or other areas throughout the yucatan they are substantially larger on an average size out here we have caught bonefish on the range from 19 to 33 inches that's the range we've had i, mean, I have never seen a, a bonefish you know it's more than 19 inches so that that tells you something about the fishery yeah i mean a 33 inch bonefish is a big bonefish. it is it is it, yeah, let's talk um, a little bit about gear because anglers that are coming out here are going to be focusing on permit and bonefish for the most part. Um, the ideal rod and reel setup to bring the scorpion. Okay, I'm not I'm not the real guy to ask me about brands. I can fish you know any brand that I have. Okay, I would just say just have a good drag. You know, um, there's there's a range of of good equipment that you can get gear from all ranges, but it has to be a very good performance. Uh, you're going to need drag, at least a smooth drag that hasn't been tight. But you need a smooth drag that, that is not, you know, hesitating when you get a bonefish because that's going to put you into your backing three, four times easily. And they take up 100, 100 yards of backing easily. Um, Nine-way rods, I would say, are the overall just to deal with the wind. People has brought eights, you know, uh, when we get the windy conditions, you cannot cast an eight rod out there you know unless it's uh, unless you're using the wind to make a longer cast but other than that i would say nines and tens uh leader over 16 pounds we don't go lighter we go over six weeks i had people cast, cast catching uh bonefish with 20 pounds i would say 16 might be the best but you know it's it's open to you know, they're they're not leader shy fish they are there. not yeah they are not and i think this week um, we were pretty much fishing nines exclusively, and I always had a couple of nines mm -hmm. set up in the boat. You know, bonefish rod was a nine, permit rod was a nine, you know, crab pattern, shrimp patterns, things like that. Um, 
Wading boots are super important super out here. Super important. Yeah. Because we're, we're over dead coral. And that, that I mean, we torn, I think we torn two pairs of boots in the last two trips. So, yeah. yeah. yeah it's pretty, it's pretty gnarly cool. wading out there. So you want to have really good wading boots and, and foot protection. Um, other key pieces of equipment for Scorpion, you want great sunglasses, like Correct. anywhere on the flats. Yes. Um, super important out here because it is all sight fishing. Um, clothing, you know, you're, we talked about long, long days out on the flats. You got to be comfortable. You got to be covered up. You got to be protected. You have to. It, we, we, we get, I mean, there's no place to hide. There's no big trees at the atoll. So there's the, 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 the highest uh, bush that you will find. There's no shade to get there. There's no, there's no I mean, you're going to be on direct sunlight all day long. Yeah. You know? That's why we, you know, normally take a break in the middle of the day. But, uh, yeah, very good protection, sun protection. And you got to bring everything that you need out here. I mean, there's no fly shop, obviously, yeah. out on the atoll. But, you know, even in Progresso Merida, you're not going to stop by and buy last minute stuff. I'm thinking in investing on a floating 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be perfect. There's, no, the there's nothing here. We have to bring from uh, toothpicks to, you know, to the most selected flies that you wanted. Yeah, but it's also important that while you need to bring everything, you also want to pack kind of light for the boat. Um, crushable duffel bag because... The boat can be tight when you get, you know, fill it full of crew and anglers. Um, space and storage is kind of at a premium. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to roll up, you know, with a bunch of steamer trunks full of unnecessary stuff. you got to be thoughtful no. about what you bring. If you're fishing five days, okay, you need five dry fit, uh, solar, whatever, uh, T-shirts, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they are packed. You can pack them in a Ziploc bag, the five together. You have you need five shorts or two or three. You're gonna wash them out one day, leave them in the sunlight. You don't need too much. I mean, I mean, I've seen people bring in too much stuff that they don't need. And when you're in a tight, well, it's not that tight, but it's gonna feel tight after this third day. You're gonna be uh, rolling around a, 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 a 65 foot boat, and uh, there's not much space to leave, you know, for for extra gear. You just need to bring what you need. We all bring backup rods just in case, you know, someone needs or they didn't bring it. Or the, the, I'm, I'm hope, you know, I'm hoping that no one loses uh, a gear and the flight, you know, and or we have backup gear just in case. Yeah, but definitely. Yeah, need need to pack light. Well, let's talk about some of your favorite flies for scorpion. And we don't need to go too extensive on this, but if you were to bring down you know, a box of bonefish flies, box of permit flies, what are some of your favorites? Okay, I'm gonna tell you just a few patterns. I, I, I'm very easy fishing, you know? I, I don't really like com complicated patterns. With the past of time, I have, it, I have fished these patterns here and they have work, okay? The verveca uh, shrimp, the mani shrimp, spawning shrimp, and um, one that it was an overall uh, fly for me uh, dr irons aaron adams yeah from btt from btt he I, I i watch a couple of videos of him he has a fly that is called the big ugly fly it's an overall pattern i have caught a uh, bonefish permit a uh, tarpon and a snook with that if you can watch it on, on youtube it should be there or or vimeo or whatever it's a it's a simple pattern that looks like a shrimpy pattern and uh actually you make the stripes with the with the marker and a little you know, uh, uh, car marks, that? little kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a bead chain and you tie the body with some fiber. Mm -hmm. You can do you, what you can use any fiber and, uh, and then craft for craft for sh deadly the tail. Yeah. Uh, I made a, I made a, a variation, a variant with legs, with silly legs. And that works pretty well. I think the leggy, all the leggy flies work well. And for, uh, crab, I think my favorite one still is the, the rackhead, you know. We fished a lot of rackheads this week. Yeah, that's yeah. that's my favorite. That's my number one. And the merkin. The merkin is also working here. Yeah. We uh, we had a lot of luck with the raghead. And, and it's super important with these flies, especially the crabs, you're going to be fishing different depths throughout the course of the day and different types of flats. And so, you know, you might be pulling a flat that's four feet deep, mm -hmm. um, hunting permit. You need a bigger much heavier crab pattern that can really sink quickly. Um, so you need to have um, a variety of different patterns, but sink rates uh, and sizes Correct. are really, really important Correct. out here too. Because yeah. then when the tide goes out and the tides, you know, they swing in a pretty big way out here, you might then be fishing, you know, six or eight inches of water and you need some really light stuff. Yesterday we were fishing ankle deep water 
and and, and, and uh, one of our guests caught one very nice fish in that water. We had to cut the bead chains because we didn't have any lighter fly. So we cut the bead chains, and that's why he got it. Yeah. Well, it, uh, it pays to have some diversity of patterns out here, but ragheads, um, gotchas, the verka shrimp, as you mentioned, you know, the basics. And, yeah. and uh, you don't need a lot of tiny flies out here. No. Just like the, the fish are not leader shy. They're not that particular about the size. So two a lot of fours. twos and fours. Twos there you go. Fours. There you go. Well, the reef that surrounds Scorpion, it's, it's, uh, we talked about that kind of in the opening. It's claimed a good number of ships over the years, and, and there's rusty wrecks and remains that are still scattered across the reef that you can you know, kind of view, and, and oftentimes you're fishing close to when you're out there. In the 1800s, they finally built a lighthouse here on the atoll, uh, and even today that lighthouse is active. It's on Isla Perez, which Isla, is the Isla Perez, right. Perez mm-hmm. the, the main island. Um, and the island is still inhabited by a lighthouse keeper. There's uh, a marine reserve staff that mm-hmm. is out here. Uh, and there's a small contingent of Mexican Navy who police the atoll and kind of protect the waters from illegal fishing and poaching. Correct. Yeah, it's nice to have those guys out in the, here. In the very first trip we had, um, there was the, the lighthouse was powered by a generator, by a diesel generator. Actually, they had two even for backup. Nowadays, you know, they cut down that pollution, and now we have solar uh, uh power for the lighthouse yeah and uh that's uh perez which is where all of that kind of infrastructure is located and the other four are inhabited yeah uninhabited, uninhabited. and at isla blanca pajaros muerta um Desterrada. Desterrada, those are the other four and they're barren i mean that you know you go to those places they're visited only by birds you know sea turtles uh, occasional lobster fishermen as you were saying some party otters in, in july and august who mm-hmm. come out and then maybe a few dozen fly anglers a year. A year. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's so cool that that exists down here. Well, we talked how every trip is uh, that you run, um, these five-day trips are limited to four to five anglers, uh, and a full group is pretty much required. And, in fact, um, it's not really a destination for non-anglers on your liveaboard. You run a fishing program. Here. Correct. Correct. And it's really suggested – that anglers kind of put together a party of their own, an intact group of, of three, four, or five people, and then have the boat to themselves. Because it's nice to, to know who you're sharing this boat with. We're living times where uh, the diversity of thoughts is being, going a little bit spreader, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I would say most of my clients, most of my anglers, either in Campeche, you know, they come in groups that they had to fish for over the years together. So th- that's the ideal to have on this boat because you're going to live five days with the same people, right? So, yeah, it's much better to have a party on the same mood than having just you know, to put people to fill in spots. Yeah, an intact group is great. Yes. And even if you have, you know, three people and want to do a buyout of the boat, very doable. You guys are fine with that. We've been hired by two guys that did the, the trip by themselves. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you know, more flats to yourself, I guess. That's perfect. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about your mothership, about the liveaboard. Describe what is the base of operations once you're out here on the atoll. Okay, the one we have now, because we've been hopping from one to other, but this one right now has, it's a 65 Hatteras. Um, It's not a new model, but it's uh, very well, you know, maintained, and we try to keep it in good shape, good maintenance. Um, The engines, and we have two power plants, you know, even for backups. Um, we carry all we can in that boat, you know, from water, fuel, the, the pangas. Uh, we tow another extra panga. So, yeah, it's pretty well prepared. Uh, it runs a maximum of 12, 13 knots. So that's why we cruise a little bit slow. We get a little bit banging with the, you know, with the seas when, it's, uh, when the wind is blowing a little bit. But, you know, it's just on time. And then we get here and every, we're, we're, we're anchoring the calm and the lee side. Yeah, and as we said, it's tight, but it's a great option. We have three here. rooms. Yeah, yeah, we have three rooms with three bathrooms. Uh, we just share the bathrooms with the crew, obviously. Yeah. We normally bring four four people in the crew, two guides and captain and mate. The captain is the cook. He cooks pretty well. You yeah. Have, you have tasted that. <laughs> <laughs> and too uh, well. Well, we do. We try to make an all inclusive. You know, we're in the live aboard. We have food. We have some drinks, some booze, some you know, soft drinks, water, plenty game, of cold beer, everything. Yeah. Cold beer. Yeah. Well, um, then each day you leave the mothership. As you said, you've got the pongas. Mm-hmm. 
One is kind of a larger boat that's a taxi that'll take you off to these different flats and islands where you can get out and then walk mm -hmm. for big waiting sessions. And then a smaller ponga that can get you out to some of the, the deeper flats, flats, the permit, the permit flats, flats, where you, you really kind of have to pull those flats. Right. Yeah, there's no way you can wade to those flats. And, yeah. and there's sharks around that area. There, so. we, we talked about the bull sharks. <laughs> They're there. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't, you don't really want to get away from that boat. Just, no. No, maybe out of the water for a quick fish picture and a release, and then That's it. back in the boat. Well, what we do every day, we talk to the, we make a plan with the clients. We try to you know get them involved with the plan, and if they feel more comfortable waiting, we take those people waiting, and the ones that really want to take a break and go you know permit fishing, they want they don't want to work that much that day. So we're very open to adjust our program. But that's basically what it is. Some people wait, some people goes in the boat. And then we mentioned the meals. the The food is great. Yeah, you don't you don't want for anything out here. You well, guys do a good job with that. We, we yeah, this is something that I talked to the captain many time many times, and he don't like any any preservatives on the on the on the food. He wants to cook everything fresh, so that that adds value to the food, right? Maybe I mean you're outside. It's not a great presentation. We put it in a kind of buffet style. Everyone gets their own, but it's very tasty. Very, very tasty. Very tasty. Yeah, some of the best fajitas I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about your guides themselves. Okay. Um, uh, your guide team is comprised of, of you know native fishermen with an outstanding ability to, to read these waters. Um, most of them are, are experienced um, and have come up through your program, Fishing for Tarpon in Campeche. Mm -hmm. And then you bring them out here, and then over the years, they've come to know these waters really well. Correct. They've been on each trip since we started in 2008. Uh, we're, we're missing one here, uh, Fernando, because he, he got sick uh, a couple of weeks ago, so he couldn't make the trip. He's going to be back quick, soon. And uh, we got Roberto. Roberto, it's an apprentice here. He hasn't done much of Caribbean or blue water fishing or flats fishing, but he does pretty well with, with tarpon. And uh, Juan, he's my head guide. Chino. Uh, Chino. She's, uh, Chino is a legend. Legend now. <laughs> he's, um, I got a story about Chino. He, uh, first time I tried to take him fishing, we were playing softball together. And uh, a, a common friend of us, uh, he, he introduced you and said, you guys, you're a sport fishing. You're a commercial fisherman. You should get together and, and, and do some fishing. And I told Chino, why don't you tell me, why don't you take me there some type of fishing? Because I'm always looking for a guy. He's like, no, you, you, you mean fishing with sticks? No, 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 that, I won't do that. So he was very reluctant to go sport fishing. Nowadays, I think he has not commercial fish for 20 years. <laughs> so, yeah, he's just and, a pure fly fishing guy. And he's... he's um, a very talented guy, you know. He he's learning in the, with, you know on the go. He's learning English, at least some fishing English, and he's a great casting coach. He can teach you casting, even if you're a very rookie. He's going to put you into a tarpon the, the, the first couple of hours that you're with him. So, yeah, and very very you know uh, expert in what he does. The only requirement for a guy to work with our company is that they get excited with every single fish. Once they lose it, they're not here, okay? So, but, you know, this, the, this lose crew... Lose the excitement, not lose the fish. No, lose the excitement, <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, this team has been here since then. No one has quit because losing the excitement. So they're, they're good. That tells you that they're a very good gang to fish with. And a lot of fun to spend a week with. Oh, yeah. These guys are great. Yeah. A lot of, lot of laughing and Just good times. Just don't give them beer, okay? <laughs> Well, what's what's cool about this area out here is that, you know, every one of these trips is really still very expeditionary. I mean, it feels expeditionary. The the whole lift to get everything together and make the crossing and be out here, you feel like you're kind of at the ends of the earth. But a lot of this stuff, you guys are still exploring and figuring out with every trip. Totally. The um, I don't know if I had this conversation with you or with Ian the other day, but... Um, Ah, that that question put me puts me back to my beginnings and actually to my my younger ages. My dad was a you know avid sports fishing guy, but in that time when I was six years old, I'm talking about 42 years ago. Um, the only thing, the only type of fishing we used to do was hand lining from the shore, but that was that was in our part of the world that was the uh, same excitement of fishing that we're having now in these days. And uh, I learned from my dad one thing. Uh, if you go to the same place every single day, it's not going to be the same result. 
but it, it has to go up and down. You can go one day, you're going to catch a fish, the next day you won't. So that tells you how uncertain the saltwater fishing is. I was talking to, I think Ian, um, that there's so much information about fishing and people tends to be now experts on what's the right time to do it, when is the best moon phase, what's the best thing to do, what's the right fly. And we are losing the excitement of just going out and try to catch fish. That's about saltwater fishing is here. It's the hunt. It's the hunt of the fish. And uh, the um, when, when, when you try to anticipate what you're going to catch, you're losing the experience of your life, okay? And more on that you come to a place that hasn't been fished, that has many factors, you have to be open to whatever happens. You can have the best fishing of your life or you can have the worst fishing of your life. The point is you're going to have fun. That's the real deal about these kind of trips. If people is too tight on catching fish, maybe this is not the right trip for them, okay? The, uh, the, the, but I can tell you, they're going to miss opportunities to catch the bonefish of their lives. That's, that's the, the real deal. So if people is looking for some trophy fish, you know, some trophy-sized bonefish, maybe this is a place to come. There are other places in the world, but this, it's a nice one. And, uh, and, and also permit. You, you witnessed uh, how, how permit could be, you know, how permit fishing could we be. We found some monster permit this week. So give, to give the opportunity to get into those records cannot be the same as going to an aquarium to catch fish. Okay? You're in a living aquarium. Fish can eat or not. The conditions can be good or wrong. Just you have to be there. And that's what take to my, 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 my dad, you know, thoughts about fishing. Just go out and have fun. No matter if you catch fish or not, just go out. If you catch fish, it's a plus. All right? If you catch the trophy of your life, that's your goal. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about this all the time on this program. And really fly fishing is so much about the amazing places that it takes you and scorpion atoll is i mean at the very top of that list there's probably no other reason you would come out here um as a, an angler unless it was to you know the the pursuit of fish with the fly and and to walk these flats and see these islands and be a part of this environment for your short stay on the atoll is such a privilege i have a friend that you may know him but he's a an outfitter too in in, in the Punta Island area, he's, he always tells me, uh, why are you doing that program? It's so difficult to get that program together. You're not making money there. I said, who cares about money this time? You know, <laughs> We're having fun. We're having fun. This is a trip that can pay for some bills. Okay, that's for the company. But this is a unique experience. In life, after COVID, most people is talking about experiences, right? So I think we started before COVID, but it's the same perspective that we have. This is a trip where, that we enjoy. It's a trip that it's a unique experience in the Gulf of Mexico. It might not be, you know, operated by 50 years. I, I'm not going to be here. But if I can do it as many times as possible, that's what life is for, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good philosophy right there. And it's a kind of a good way to, to close out the segment. Um, you touched on you know the topic of who should make this trip what kind of angler should come to scorpion and and this trip is definitely not for everyone it's uh it's probably not ideal for the faint of heart i mean the crossing can at times be rough the wind is is legit it's it's here and it's usually blowing pretty hard um the living and sleeping quarters are a bit snug even on a 65 foot boat uh, you're typically going to be wading and fishing long days on fairly rough terrain. Um, I would say you should be in fairly good shape to come and fish scorpion. I think that's a, a good piece of advice um, because you're also far from shore and away from, from any medical assistance if needed. But, you know, the fish are, are big. They're not easy. Uh, this is for sure a quality over quantity type fishery. Um, but it's, it's amazing once you're here. And, you know, in a day and age where so many Caribbean fisheries are seeing more anglers and increased pressure, Scorpion offers this solitude, uh, you know, pristine waters and flats fish that, that see very few anglers. There's yeah, not... and that won't change. We're, we're not going to put more trips and more trips and together. No, it's, it's not, that's not our goal. We just want to have a, we have a sustainable fishery. And, uh, and, 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 and back to the question, uh, who, who should come fishing here? I think uh, anyone willing to take that 
uh, explorer spirit out. That soul, adventurous soul, has to be very present in the people that has to come here. Because, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it this way. Because in the in the very uh, uh, worst condition, you know, we had trips that we had to abort because of a weather coming. So what we do, just to not to lose the week, we go back to Campeche and fish for tarpon, right? But there's days that uh, we can stay here and the fishing goes very nice for three days and then poof, two days go down, totally. Some people get a little frustrated, but that's the way fishing is here, all right? And, uh, and, and if you come with a very high expectation, that's, that's a problem. You, you should come with a mean expectation. Just find the, uh, a, a good opportunity to have fun and catch fish. And then that will round up a good experience if you have a very nice fish, right? So the point is anyone can come, but has to have a soul that will to explore and adventure. You know, that's the real deal. I love it. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for uh, sitting down with us today and, and talking about Scorpion. And thanks for having us out again. It's been an amazing five days. It's always a pleasure to fish with you. This gang was also amazing. What, what else can I ask for? I'm in the right place with the right people, right? That's what it's all about. That's fly fishing. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, that is it for this latest episode of Waypoints, the podcast that is 100% dedicated to travel, adventure, and exploration. Be sure to visit yellowdogflyfishing.com to plan and research your next fishing trip, sign up for newsletters and new podcasts, and stay up to date on the latest travel news and developments. Join us for our next episode of Waypoints, and remember, life is short and no one ever regretted a life of adventure. This has been another episode of Waypoints, the podcast of fly fishing travel and adventure angling. Waypoints is produced by Brian Gregson with music provided by the Steep Canyon Rangers. Visit yellowdogflyfishing.com for more destination profiles, travel news, and expert advice, and be sure to join us for our next episode.